Hi, I'm Don Lombardi, and I'm here to talk to, in the beautiful state of Maine, where it gets really cold during the winter, David Ward. Uh, we both do videos from time to time, so David, take it over. Four, three, two, one, go. One, two, This is huge, musicians. I'm the record. Bring it on. Hi, welcome to Musicians on the Record. I'm David Ward. This is the show where we get the musician story and we talk with musicians and artists from the world of music. Today, you, you've heard of all of this stuff. It's the creator and founder of DW Drums and the Drum Channel. Don Lombardi is on the show today. Welcome, Don. Thank you very much. Uh, and we all know that drummers are musicians too, right? Don't That's forget right. about that out there. That's right. Well, I, I don't see where the joke came from, first of all, because you're, I still haven't figured it out of like how to move all four limbs in a coordinated thing separately. If that's not a musician, I don't know what is. It's crazy, right? No, yeah. that definitely. Yeah, it's amazing. So thank you so much for being on the show. I'd, I'd love to talk a little bit about your story and then obviously with the creation of DW and the drum channel, it all started with uh, an adjustable trap seat. Is that, is that accurate? Well, the manufacturing started there. I guess the whole idea of uh, filling a need for drummers came when I started playing drums, which was, you know, at nine or 10 years old and then 14 joined the union and then started playing professionally when I was 16 and fortunately had the opportunity to study with some really good teachers. And one of the things, um, especially Freddie Gruber, was really particular about was sitting uh, really firmly on your throne. Um, in fact, the, the, uh, the students of Freddie through the years, who were speaking just the other day with one, um, who was passing on that information, um, and that subject came up again, how you really, you know, first thing is you have to have a seat that's really solid because you're going to be balancing yourself on it much like a dancer would. So back in the day, in the 60s and 70s, guys used that was the stablest was a Rogers seat. Um, it was probably the least comfortable seat top, but the most stable throne. So it was kind of like you had to give up something for something else. And a lot of guys would put some foam over it on top of it. So uh, then there was the ultimate, which was the uh, trap case seat which Ludwig made, Slingerland made, Roger Smith, often called the Buddy Rich seat, which was the cylinder that was 24 inches high. Uh, and that's the way the companies made it. And it only came in that one height. So I got to thinking, wouldn't it be cool if somebody would make one that adjusted? Because what's the chance you're going to want to sit at 24 inches? Right. And in fact, when I had opportunities to sit behind Buddy's kit and Ed Shaughnessy's kit and Louis's kit, uh, who used that type of a seat, None of them were 24 inches, so they obviously made customs one for those guys, yes. uh, whatever they would need. But for us normal drummers out there, somebody decided 24 was, was the right size. Okay. I only came to find out years later, and this is a good symptom of what drummers have had to put up with through the years, which uh, I tried to stop in starting DW. Why do you think factories made them at 24 inches? There's my question for you. You thought you were going to be asking me all the questions, right? <laughs> That's a great question. Are, are, were they thinking that the average height of a drummer is 5'10", 6 feet? Uh... Nothing, nothing to do with anything that would have been that smart. Uh, <laughs> okay. I, I asked that to an old uh, pro from Slingerland, and he said, well, because we got two out of a 4 by 8 piece of plywood. So, <laughs> so there you go. Well, that was sim yeah, simple to them, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, right. All the great uh, scientific uh, trials and tribulations that go into a lot of things drummers have had to put up with through the years. So right. the whole right. idea is to come at it from the drummer's perspective. So the long-winded answer is, you know, I thought it would be really cool to make one that adjusted. And I started doing it just for friends. And then I got a couple of calls from other people who I didn't know. Hey, I saw this guy that had one. I put a little ad in the Musicians Union. This was even predating Modern Drummer back in the day. That was the way you would advertise. $75 uh, adjustable trap case seat. And I was getting orders for three, four, five a month on a, you know, on a good bunch, which was way more than I could make. I could make one every couple of months for fun. But uh, it also turned a major light on in my head. If you made something to fill a need, 
You didn't need a name. I mean, I was getting checks from New York and Chicago. Send me 75 bucks, I'll make a seat for you. They didn't know what was going to happen after they sent me the 75 bucks. But, you know, I guess within the drumming community, there's a certain amount of trust. So, right. Uh, right. but it just, it proved the thought, uh, the, the business thought to me that, you know, if you did fill a need, you could be successful at what you were doing. Not to know at all at that point in time that I was going to have to think about that experience, you know, three or four years later. Yeah. So, so you obviously had some skill, though, not only in drumming, but like with what? Wood, woodworking, metalworking? How did you make these? None. Zero. Zero. No. no. Uh, pretty, as much as any hobbyist would, you know, who knows how to get a saw out and do a few things. So it was, it was totally from the ground up. And that's where uh, when I got a few orders, one of my students was John Good who was good with his hands uh, oh. and putting things together and making things. Uh, and so there came, you know, us working together to say, hey, I, you know, make some of these seats for me. I'll give you free drum lessons. And that was at the beginning of Drum Workshop, using that name as a teaching studio back in those days, That's which incredible. I started in 1972 as a teaching studio. Uh, John came in a couple of years later, and then we were making seats during that period. Um, I, I, we weren't a manufacturer. We we're just making them, you know, for fun and, and a few just to supplement, you know, our incomes. Um, I was still teaching 40, 50 students a week at that period and playing six days a week and a couple afternoons. So it was, it was uh, quite a full-time life. Um, and then the opportunity to manufacture came up in 1970, late 77, 78. It was just a drum cylinder that had a seat top on it. So obviously it was solid because it was just going right down to the floor, um, but they were they were only one height. So the best way to have the solid a seat is a cylinder that goes down to the floor, obviously. And got if you it. can have one you could adjust, then you got the best of both worlds. Okay. Keeping in mind, back in those days, you could actually pack up your hardware and put it in your seat. Right. Uh, it wasn't until a few years later, you know, your symbol boom stand required a pickup truck. Right. Yeah. And but you guys do some good stuff on that too. I've heard that's uh, some of the lightest stuff. The six thousands, the stands. Yeah. And the, in the DW line, as uh, you know, I don't want to say that all things are made as a result of things that I need particularly, but I'm fortunately in touch with a whole lot of drummers. But as I got older, I wanted things to get lighter, and then I realized a lot of other drummers are getting older too. So I. We had the, uh, you know, our lightweight 6,000, and then now we even have the ultralight, which is even a little bit lighter than that, and doesn't work for every playing occasion, but works for your average gigging playing occasion. So the, mm. the only way I can get it lighter now for next year is helium. Helium, so right. <laughs> helium will actually levitate off the ground. Sure, sure. You just get some pegs and hold it down, right? Exactly, so, right. Yeah. Take your symbol off and then catch your stand. There you go. There you go. I'm, I'm curious about what you said earlier. Let's go back to your story with drumming. And what, what about the drums called to you at nine? Um, I saw Buddy Rich, story many people have told, mm -hmm. uh, playing at, a, at a, in an early age. I was about 14 when I seriously thought this is something I would want to do. Uh, at nine, I saw a, it was a television show which just opened up with a real close-up on the jazz cymbal rhythm on the hi-hat. Um, I haven't run down what the name of that is, but I would love to do that. It was one of those, could have been a Sid Caesar hour, could have been one of those. It would have been, you know, in the early 50s. But I just loved that And so I told my dad I wanted to try that. So we went to a music store, and I said, what do you need to go And he said, well, you need a hi-hat and a pair of cymbals. So I bought a hi-hat and a pair of cymbals, you know. I messed around with them in my bedroom until I could create that sound. And then it was like, hey, you know, I think I'd like to take some some drum lessons. So I just went to the local music store and started drum lessons. So um, had, had I, you know, known it was really good to start with a hi-hat, because that's where you learn how to play the basic swing pattern anyway, sure. uh, might not have been a bad idea. But I don't think young students, when they go in to take drum lessons, are going to want to hear, great, go home with a hi-hat. <laughs> <laughs> or a then practice pad. Pra yeah, then I got a snare drum and a practice pad. Uh, and then at, uh, at, at 16, um, just as I got out of high school, I started auditioning for a band and then started playing professionally. Wow. And you said something about a union. Say more about that. Well, yeah. Well, that was just a, at 14, I was in a Dixieland band and we did some television shows. So you had to be in the union to do that. So mm -hmm. I, I, thinking, you know, I was going to audition for the musicians union, Local 47. Of course, I stayed up all night, practiced as much as I could. Uh, only 13 rudiments back in those days, which made it a lot easier. But I didn't know it, so I just 
I go into this room, kind of a dark room. This old guy comes in and says, play me a long roll. Play me a paradiddle. Okay, you got it. So I figured, wow, that was <laughs> yeah, pretty good, right? <laughs> not too hard to get into the union. I think the main thing he was excited about is uh, my parents were out there with their checkbook. Right. But in any event, it, it, it worked. Yeah. Uh, and not, not to think all these years later, I get my pension checks. That's not right. bad either. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. And how did your folks, Don, how did they feel about you picking up the drums and doing lessons and starting to play professionally? Well, uh, wasn't their, probably their first choice. Didn't really have uh, professional music in my family. My dad was kind of an amateur trombone player, my mom piano, so could sit around the house and, and have some fun with it. But uh, they didn't really play in bands, but uh, very much liked music. And so I think, you know, like uh, for all the years I taught, it was always interesting because the parents are very excited that the kids are interested in music and playing drums and, hey, he's doing really good. And then... Um, I, I never forget the after about five years of teaching this individual, he was then going to go to school and major in music. And the parents came in and said, "Hey, uh, you have to do something. He wants to be a musician, a drummer." And I said, "Wait a minute! I thought that we wanted him to be. A, he thought we were going to be an attorney, you know, or he was going to go to medical school." So that's what talk him out of it, right? Kind of like I, I did a great job until I, you know, did such a good job that he actually wanted to play drums for a living. Uh, <laughs> So uh, they were kind of along that road, you know, they were very encouraging, you know, and as I started playing with some older musicians and working regularly, and they saw this was a real, uh, this was a real vocation. Um, mm -hmm. Probably the, the, you know, the hardest thing for them to understand was getting into manufacturing, because that took every penny I had, it took a lot of money, it took a lot of time, and like, you know, what, how many people in the world would buy a drum pedal, you know, for a businessman, it didn't seem like that was a very viable vocation. But uh, after a few years, they were a million percent supportive of that, uh, to the tune of lending me money, which helped make the whole company possible. So that's good, too. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Thank you to them. That's great. You, you mentioned Buddy Rich. Um, and obviously, he hooked you in as a drummer. Who were some other inspirations for you drumming wise, or just music in general? Uh, I used to, to say, um, well, I used to say it because nobody's asked me this recently, or I would still say it, that, you know, if you take Buddy Rich and Mel Lewis and Ringo Starr and Elvin Jones and put them at the four corners of the world, um, everybody is some amalgamation somehow, you know, amongst all of those great, what they have to bring and what they bring to the instrument, what they bring to the table. So I, I was a huge jazz buff growing up. Um, probably way overly opinionated in that area than I should have been as a teenager. But, uh, and this was growing up in, in the 60, early 60s when all that was happening. You know, right. uh, the Coltrane Quartet yeah. was going. Elvin turned the way people played the drums, you know, people right. pretty much upside down. Right. Um, huge Jimmy Cobb fan with, with Miles Davis. And yeah. so honored to have him out to Drum Channel for four days. We have great content about Jimmy and all of his experiences and the real – kind of the real behind the scenes stories when you get yeah. those guys got out here to talk about what life was like in New York and, and what right. have you. Um, well, you must... And then of course all, you know, huge Chicago fan that was, you know, never thought in those days I'd be able to meet those drummers and become friends with them. Buddy, I got to know quite well in his later life through two mutual friends of mine, Frank DeVito and Nick Ciroli. Cool. Excellent. Yeah. That must be a, a fantastic, I mean, you, you're selling all kinds of incredible drums and equipment too, but to meet these guys who are making the music, uh, it must be an incredible part of your job, right? Yeah, well, it's, it's, I, I've been lucky to know a lot of them when I was growing up in L.A. Uh, here living in, in Los Angeles. Uh, and, and then as time went by in manufacturing, got to meet a lot of them, obviously, uh, through looking at you know, what their needs were. The most fun was being able to sit next to them you know, really close and see how they played. And that's, that's something that from teaching with Freddie Groover, you know, the years I studied with him, it was all about how you use your body to motivate and follow the mouse of the stick. It wasn't like, here's how I'm going to change a little bit of what you're doing. It's just like, look at how Buddy is doing what, is he, he, what he's doing. Look at how, and so I, I've always enjoyed, maybe that's the, you know, the mechanical side of me, looking at seeing, and not only obviously appreciating the musicality of the greatest drummers in the world, but seeing what they're doing to do that, you know, how this drummer is using this type of technique, this one's using this type of technique, how he's using it, um, the differences between match grip and, and you know, and, and conventional grip. 
uh, and the commonalities between those things too. So I, I love the study of the instrument in terms of how somebody is creating what they're creating. Mm. Yeah. And, and you mentioned Freddie Gruber, obviously a legend in drumming and uh, in teaching. Can you talk about him a little bit more and how did you connect with him? Uh, how long do you have before the sun goes down there? I think it's pretty early in the day. Yeah. <laughs> this might be the longest uh, okay. interview that you've ever done here. Uh, sure, I got time. We got time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll change it to musicians off the record by the time I get done with this. Uh, the... Uh, <laughs> The uh, Freddie I knew uh, very well. Uh, going, he was introduced to me by Terry Gibbs uh, because my teacher for four years before Freddie Gruber was Nick Ciroli. I mm-hmm. studied with Nick Ciroli when I was 16, 17, 18. Um, he got the Tijuana Brass gig. He, Nick Ciroli became the drummer in the Tijuana Brass traveling band. Hal Blaine did most of the recordings up to that period. Uh, but um, and so he was then that was a huge band uh, in that they, they were traveling, you know, all the time on the road. So so kind of my every week teacher, you know, is, is gone. And so I I wanted to continue to study and get more into the technical side of the instrument. Nick had great technique, but he was like an unbelievably, unbelievable musical player. One of the probably the most underrated players of all time. If you're uh, people watching aren't aware of Nick Ciroli, they should listen to. Bob Florence's big band, anything they could listen to of, of, of Nick. Uh, Nick and, and Mel Lewis, uh, who, of course, lived through his full life. Nick passed away in, in an early, at, at 40 years old, I think, of a heart attack. Um, but um, he and Mel Lewis were in, in musicianship comparable. Um, and so that he would be somebody that should be, you know, learned about as young students have to go back and learn about all the, all the luminaries. But basically, um, studying with... Uh, with Nick, and then when Nick left town, uh, Terry introduced me to Freddie, who had just moved out here from New York and was just at the very beginning of his teaching career, if you will, you know, uh, on the West Coast, which was kind of the beginning of his teaching career. And he taught differently back in those days. He would take you as if you had never, even though he was teaching drummers who had played, uh, who were players, um, he wasn't teaching, you know, superstar professional drummers. He was teaching aspiring young drummers. And he would take you right back to the practice pad for six months. Wow. So, and, and you'd have to put up with that or yeah. move on because he, he needed you to do what he wanted you to do. He wasn't, he wasn't molding you. He was trying to shape you. It was a little different process mm. than he did in later years. And what was that? What what did you sort of that biggest takeaway or lesson that you learned from him, Don? Well, uh, obviously, uh, teaching, you know, teaching throughout all those years, he would take younger students who were more beginners, and that's kind of, you know, the, that was part of the impetus of uh, Drum Workshop at the beginning, and he would pass those on to, to myself or Danny Dennis, a couple of teachers we had at our little teaching studio, um, and it was his method of the way, not trying to show somebody what to play, but show them how to play it, <laughs> and then you would go to study with, uh, back in those days, if you could get together with Shelly Mann, or you could go to uh, some of the luminary drummers who also taught, they would show you how to use your technique to play what they're, what they're playing. So it was, it was a real, I think it was mainly the understanding that, and he used to say it over and over again, how, what, and why. You have to learn how to play, then you want to learn what to play, and then you need to learn why to play it. Mm-hmm. And Great drummers understand all of those. Many, many drummers, even famous drummers, don't have all of those. Uh, they, they learn what to play, and it's a huge YouTube, you know, we talk about it a lot on Drum Channel and, and forums recently. Um, it's one of the downsides of YouTube. You can copy people and you can do covers, right. but you're never really learning how they played in order for them to create what they're doing. And so... You, you can become is a really good copy, which could probably land you a gig, but uh, you're missing out on the foundation. Hmm. That's great. Um, I love that right there. That's wonderful. So you're, you're working really hard. You're playing out. You're playing with bands at that time as well? Uh, I'm playing with bands, yeah. I, I would have to say, you know, I, I stayed in town to raise my son, so I wasn't up for traveling, uh, but at a fairly early, early when I was 27. Uh, and before that, it was a whole different landscape here in LA. It was, you know, I, I recently talked to a, a young drummer and I said, yeah, we were talking about PJs, I think, and some clubs that were well-known back here in LA back in the days. Um, 
and that was a that was a large three three big rooms and a nightclub on Sunset. Um, and they, uh, I said, yeah, I was playing at these this club for five years, and he's like, what? You right. played? They, they're used to doing the eleven o'clock set, you know, at the whiskey with five other bands, you know. Right, right. I said, yeah, there was many clubs in L.A. where they had booked bands and you would be the house band and people would come there to see you play. And, uh, and, uh, I would never consider myself a studio musician, but back in those days, it was, there was so much work, uh, to do a jingle from time to time. Uh, you know, the, the great drummers would get called to do these projects that were not records, you know, and it's a four hour block, a union, union scale block three, and then you get there and set up and it might be a 20 minute date. Remember the first studio thing I ever did was at Wally Hyder's, and again I was really nervous. Um, I think Frank DeVito had referred me. He, you know, he got a call and he was he was busy, and so um, it might have been even Nick. But uh, so again, I'm sight reading all night long, and I'm doing everything because I'm figuring like, oh, and I'm I'm a red light syndrome guy. I'm not the best personality for the studio. You know, I like live, I like jazz, I like improvisation a little bit more. Yep. Anyway, I get there and I set up and there's a guitar player comes, bass player comes, uh, and the producer comes out and says, okay, I, I need like 16 bars of a bossa nova. I'm like, okay. That's all he needed. <laughs> 10 minutes. <laughs> that was it. And we were gone. Yeah, right, right. So I, fortunately, I knew how to play a bossa nova because Nick had taught me that. So I, I, I nailed it. But so... Uh, but the point is, there was it was a whole different landscape, you know, and, and yep. I was never out of work in 20 years, which I'm, you know, mm -hmm. I'm grateful for, because um, if you have a good foundation and you know how to read and you can play and you can play different styles, uh, there's more than enough work in town to do that. On top of teaching literally 40, 50 students a week, I was teaching four or five days a week. It's amazing. Um, Amazing. So it was it was it was a, a, a fun time that went by really fast, but kind of laid a, a big groundwork as I got into manufacturing, because I, I knew a lot about what the needs of drummers were. What was the dream, Don, for you when you were playing, you were gigging, you were learning, you know, from all these great teachers and teaching others? Did you have a, a dream for yourself as far as career-wise drumming? I figured I would be a professional drummer. Now, at the same time, I, I you know, I, I always looked up to and, you know, aspired to, as a lot of drummers did, you know, how does Buddy Rich do what he does? And nobody in the world has to do that or is going to be that. And you're not going to be, I don't care how many hours a day you practice because he is who he is and, right. and you are who you are. But, uh, but I, uh, I'd always thought that I would, you know, that's what I would do for a living. Uh, the same token, I looked around and I was very realistic that there were some unbelievably good drummers out there who, you know, the studio thing was extremely tight, uh, hard to get into at, you know, at an A level. Uh, and especially in LA, you know, how do you get to be as good as these people? So I was kind of realistic about, I, I love teaching as much as I did playing, I'll say. I had as much of a passion for that as I did, as I did performing. So I was, I, I, I was thinking that, you know, my career would go, you know, down that road. Um, and the manufacturing, which I thought would be a hobby at the beginning, uh, you know, after the first you know year or so, I got the bug. I thought this is this is another way you can hang out with drummers and improve the quality of their lives and still be involved. And uh, I never thought I'd be at a point where I just had no time to practice. Um, is that but, where it is now? Well, that well, I'm I'm getting back into it though. Right. So uh, so. Look out, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And do you still teach at all, or is that just no, too good? No, no. I mean, uh, it's, you know, I had to not burn the candle at both ends, starting even in the, uh, by the mid-80s, it was 60, 70 hours a week just wow. with the company. Amazing. Yeah, so let's talk about that shift from the playing and the teaching to the manufacturing. Obviously, all of that stuff took off uh, with you and then with you and John. Uh, what were some of those other needs that you started seeing or that you had already seen in the drum community? Well, it was an interesting time. I had uh, several things in my favor that, you know, in hindsight that I look back on. Um, one big one for entrepreneurs of, of that era and this era, um, which I never considered myself one of, I, you know, I never quite understood the, the definition of an entrepreneur. When I hear people talk about that at, 
uh, first thing that rang in my mind is somebody that doesn't get paid for overtime because you just you work 70 hours a week and you just do whatever you can. And I guess if, you know, if I'm an entrepreneur, there we go. Uh, right. So it might not be the best thing in the world. but um, And you do something that's fun. And you do see a light at the end of the tunnel, you know, always. So I, I, I starting out, you know, I, I, I was encouraged uh, because I had the opportunity to buy the molds and dyes of the Campco Drum Company which uh, was a very small manufacturer back in the day, um, maybe represented three or less percent of all sales back then. It was kind of the only, if you could call it, kind of garage operation that existed. Um, and then Gretsch was like the next small company, but probably 10 times bigger than Campco back in those days. Then you had the majors, which was Ludwig Slingel and Rogers. But if you look back through the 60s, and now we're getting into the later 70s, the American companies had grown extremely large uh, when the Beatles hit. They, they were entrepreneurial companies at one point. You know, there was a Bill Ludwig the first and, right. and right. Rogers and Slingerland, Bud Slingerland. Uh, and when it became really big business, these larger corporations came in and bought them up and started with musical instrument divisions. Um, uh, as you know, Fender has today, as uh, which they you know they we we ended up with LP as a result of them downsizing and going more in the direction of just keeping Fender. But but you had CBS, which had you know a musical instrument division of which right. Rogers you know became a part of. So when those small companies became acquired by larger corporations, I'm now sitting in you know my little. Uh, drum studio and have the opportunity to get into making drum pedals, it's like, what could I do different than, you know, than these guys? And, and their competition at that time was Pearl and Tama and uh, pretty much just getting into it, I think was uh, Yamaha. Well, Yamaha was a little more into it in the, in the earlier 80s, I believe. So now I had to think, okay, I have the American manufacturers, I had no problem really competing against them because um, they had so many layers of bureaucracy. Nobody was there as, you know, kind of the drumming mentor. Uh, and drummers are, I can say this in a nice way, are, you know, are a crazier group of consumers than any other m musical group. You know, sure. musicians are probably, if you're talking to a business person and they're getting into this, they say, well, marketing to musicians is kind of interesting because they have a certain way of looking at things. Well, Marketing to drummers is even more interesting because right. we want to feel things when they tighten up. Right. We want to have something go where it can't go. We want to be sure you can set it up the same time the next time. So there's a lot of little nuances. Uh, and a drum isn't a drum is a drum. You know, uh, to the average person, a drum is loud and it sounds like a drum. But right. with a microphone on it and you're going to hear a whole different spectrum of, of sound. So how do you make a drum that really sings and is, has a certain tonal quality to it? So I just thought, you know, if, if drums weren't in my immediate uh, eyesight, I mean, it was something that I thought would always be fun, but solving some of the hardware problems of the day was of most interest to me. And that was the bass drum pedal because again, the, uh, the foreign companies that had come in saw a very labor intensive industry making a drum set. There's no way to really automate it. You're, People are screwing them on. If you put a drum set together in your garage, it's the same way they're putting it together in China and the same way we put it together here. You're screwing it together. You're holding parts. You know, uh, you can automate the buffing and some of the drilling and stuff like that. But um, So they were then looking at uh, American industry, um, which is well, the products being made here in the early 80s at a $12 an hour labor rate as opposed to under a dollar an hour in Taiwan. So how could the American drum, company, drum companies compete? How could me and my little garage, you know, compete? I had to look at what void there was, you know, in the marketplace, if you're looking at it, you know, as a business. And selfishly to me and to my friends, I played on a Campco pedal. They played on a Campco pedal. If the Campco drum company sold or went out of business, who's going to make the pedal for us? So I thought, well, I could make seats and make a little bit of money. I could make pedals and make a little bit of money here too. So yes. obviously I had to borrow a chunk of money to get all the tooling, dyes, and molds. I didn't get the name Camp Go, as you know, that history that went to Hoshino Tama. Uh, and so started out making pedals because the competition didn't see that as that important a part of the drum set. 
Yeah, interesting. Like you don't even see it. So yeah. like it's just behind the guy's drums, you know, anything he can use back there rather than I knew it was his most important part of the drum set. It's what created, you know, was between you and the feel of what you heard and what you played. So, so I took the camp go pedal and we started making it very much as it had been, but making many improvements to it so that it would last for the drummer of the seventies, the drummer of the fifties or the sixties wasn't thinking the metal was in. Right. You know, right. I've got Tommy Lee jumping off his drum seat and landing on the pedal. So right. uh, literally, so uh, Greg Bissonette also with David Lee Roth, you know, yes, so, right, exactly. so I had to make a, the challenge was make a pedal that feels as good as the old pedal, but will last. And that was, that was for the first five to seven years, we were pedal people mm. and I had to make anything I could out of those dies and molds because I didn't have money to do anything new. So Easy. That's where the double pedal came out. We had an electric EP1 pedal. Uh, and, an electric? Uh, yeah, we had an EP1. Well, it was a trigger pedal, just okay. a trigger pedal with a, with a piezo sensor. Okay, really. I didn't know if you hit a button and it just did the bass drum on its own. So. No, 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 no. It didn't, no, no brain at all. That would help my drumming, but that's okay. <laughs> well, that, was, that was an early one. Maybe that's coming up next, right? Maybe that's the next need. So. I'm sure it's out there somewhere. And the double pedal was, you know, we struggled for years, had to borrow more money, and um, that was part of, you know, an entrepreneur's problems in today's day and age. Cause I recently heard an interview on, I think it was PBS where entrepreneurs of the seventies and eighties were able to finance their companies through equity in their house, which is what I did, you know, many times over. I, I bought a house in 70, refinanced it three times by the middle of 80 to put money into the company. Sure. That doesn't exist for entrepreneurs today. So if you have to borrow money, it puts you in a real bad spot because, you know, you then have, you know, uh, a whole different, you know, expense that you have to come up with and you can barely make it without that expense. Right. No uh, you're, again, it's a very labor intensive business to make it in America. Sure. So with the original Camco pedal, that was the first uh, double pedal? No, the original Campco pedal was always a single pedal. Always a um, single. So you guys I, actually put on the double pedal. Yeah, I took, I took, I, I looked at everything that made a single pedal and figured what else could I make out of it? You know, I can't make a part for a car. I can't make something for, you know, uh, a sporting event. So, but it has to have something to do with drums. So I had, grew up with uh, a dear friend is Jim Keltner. I've known Jim since I was 16. Uh, we were teenagers playing drums, you know, as we grew up. And I uh, hung out with him once. He was somewhere, and he was using the Zelmer Twin, which was a double pedal that worked off of a spring. Hmm. Didn't functionally, you couldn't play it really. But it, but it was you were able to use both feet and get both beater balls hitting. Um, many historians out there know the pedal; they would know what I'm what I'm saying. The the left side never stopped. You had to kind of throw it, and the beater ball would hit and come back. And uh, and there was a, there was another one that was. Um, from Australia, Slashman, which was two two footboards that were a little bit off center to the bass drum, but then that screwed up the position of the rest of your drum. So it was right. there wasn't one that where the left side felt like you'd be playing double bass, and and double bass was popular in those days. So I just said there's got to be some way to create a double pedal where the left side will feel as good as the right. Um, and it took you know I would say we got it. 80% is good with the first double pedal, then maybe 90% is good. And with our, you know, with our new machine drive, you yeah. can put your right foot over on it. You really don't know the difference. But 70% but, but was more than good enough because the guy's technique wasn't near as good with his left foot as it was with his right anyway. So he didn't know that it wasn't quite as good. He just thought he was going gangbusters, you know. So, uh, and the idea of it was, um, I said in a Modern Drummer article, I think in 1982, after we first came out with it, that I thought it would be a mainstay uh, of, of a drummer's drum set because it would allow you to do things that you couldn't do, not just double bass drum, you know, big finish things, but musically do some things that, you know, you would need to do. Even though you might be able to play as fast with one foot, you're not going to get the same articulation as you would if you had uh, tried two feet. So the double pedal, we came out with an 82 uh, to the NAMM show, and that was the beginning of the company, you know, being on its feet, you know, financially having, so we had something nobody else had for two years. 
That's awesome. It's great. And you know, the double pedal is great because you only have to use still one bass drum. You don't have to lug around two bass drums. That's, that's a bit of a challenge. So that's, yeah. that's a big advantage to it also. Yeah. No, no question. Yeah. And so how did it move then from making those kind of things, Don, into the, these gorgeous, you know, I, I see some of these videos that you and John Good are doing these, he's going into the rainforests of, oh, of wherever. Are, and how is that? There's, we can track him now on our phones. <laughs> we know where he's at. Otherwise, there's no telling where he's going to end up. <laughs> yeah. The double pedal brought up an interesting uh, series of things. We had a, Once we got that patented, it then led to, well, three legs on a hi-hat are in your way. So we have to do a two-legged hi-hat. Mm. So we got a patent on that. Yes. Then it was like, it would be nice if you could have a remote hi-hat on the other side. So kind of the, you know, our, our pedal plan through the 80s was double pedal, two-legged hi-hat, remote hi-hat. That was, Vinny used that, Vinny Caliuta was one of our staunch yeah. early endorsees. He used that combination on, you know, almost everything he did through those, through those years. And we were, you know, we added the cymbal stand into the lineup um, and, uh, and kind of to round out the hardware. Uh, then it was, we made a drum set every couple of months. It was a hobby. It wasn't, you know, the mainstay, um, getting the, getting a hardware drum company, you know, uh, financially, you know, stable, uh, took about six, seven years, you know, so, and, and keep in mind that you're making a bass drum pedal or products that sell for 150 bucks, you know, in those days. Right. So, uh, making a drum set that would sell for two thousand dollars, you know, you you have to sell a lot of pedals just to buy enough parts to make one drum set. So it was it was, we, but we would do it from time to time. And over a period of, you know, we would just roll up the back door, spray it when nobody was looking, hoping that people next door to us wouldn't complain from the fumes. Uh, and, remember the first drum set you made? That pardon? That was. Well, uh, yeah, actually, the, well, the, the first one, when we bought the tooling dies and mold, we also got some drum shells that Campco had left over. So uh, Colin Bailey, uh, Nick Ciroli, my teacher, Nick, got one of the very first kits, and he was a financial you know, supporter of the site, of the, rather, of the company also. Um, and Colin Bailey, who I studied with also, and Freddie Gruber, I kind of made sets for my three teachers, if you would, right away, and got them to them. Uh, and they became you know, our first three endorses too. But that, that over a period of, of years, when we got up into 83, 84, there was a lot of players that had it as their behind the scenes kit. Yeah. So we weren't looking for any endorses or any endorsements. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously um, we were just, we, we had endorses and endorsements for the pedal mm -hmm. uh, and, and for the hi-hat, yeah. but uh, not for the drums. Cause we really weren't in the drum business and, right. and, and in those days, and in this day, you know, uh, a lot of other companies put these drummers on their payroll, and I was I was not paying myself. So I, right. I mean, it's not our philosophy anyway to do that. So so there's there's a period in the '80s where all of a sudden we're getting some buzz from some dealers saying, "Hey, I hear you got a drum set to this guy, or this guy's making drums, and you know, maybe we should try it out." And, Put a drum set in our store and see how it goes. And so I, I didn't do that until 1990. Is the first NAM show we went to to say, hey, we're a drum company. We're not just a drum hardware company. You can buy our drums too. It's fantastic. And I mean, these exotic wood shells that you guys are doing, plus all of the, the regular, the maple, the oak, the birch, the metal. Well, we, we have a we have a huge. Uh, team of scientists here with their white coats on. No, we don't. No, okay. <laughs> I, I That's just John, once, isn't it? Right? Once, once there was a sonar ad with all these guys with their white coats on but around the drum set. <laughs> I thought was, I'm looking around in the picture to find the drummer, you know? You're so right. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's a lot of brainstorming. I mean, even for the pedals, you know, um, and trial and error, too, uh, to find out what works. And some things are just... Uh, you try one thing or a, a drummer will come to you, you know, big, a big amount of our inventions come from drummers come to us saying, Hey, I need this. I need that. Uh, the, uh, uh, just digressing for a second, just the little symbol sleeve that we have that tightens up the space you have between your two symbols. Yeah. Jonathan Moffat's with Michael Jackson, John Goods out as his drum tech. Oh. And during his solo, he likes to hit a splash symbol behind him and grab it, but wobbles too much. 
Yeah. So it's like, could you make something to keep that from wobbling a little bit more? So those, I mean, when it gets to the drums themselves, then it's like, hey, you know, I, I, my, my 10-inch tom just sounds so boingy and bongo-y, you know, compared to the 12. Can, what can we do there? So we started out, you know, when we, we went to the NAMM show in 1990, uh, you probably heard this story. I, I went there with the hopes of selling 15 drum sets. Because mm. at that point, we had 15 really good hardware dealers selling our pedals. So they were friends. So it's like, I figured each one of them, we could talk them into taking one kit. Sure. And try it out, you know, that's not going to kill you, you know. Right, right. Uh, but I was very concerned because we were 24, 2500 bucks. Their top end drums in those days were 16, 17. So we were almost a thousand dollars more than a high end competitor's brand, if you will. Sure. So um, we go to the NAM show, which was a three day show back in those days. And, uh, and my son comes to me at the end of the first day and says, We got to get John together. We got a problem. Cause Chris was just starting to do sales at that time. Uh, so I'm, I'm preparing to build him up and say, look, it might take a couple of, you know, a year or so, but we'll, we'll, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll, we'll just keep pecking away at it. So he said, no, no, that's not the problem. So first day of the show, we sold 60 drum sets. Oh my God. So every dealer, what I didn't think about, cause I thought it took so long to get, you know, past the pedal, you know, the, the idea of like building our brand and having a pedal that worked, sure. then you got to start all over again with drums. But right. the fact that people knew we made a quality product, yeah. they didn't even think twice about how good the drums were going to be. That's like, yeah, I don't want to miss out. Uh, and then it was kind of like, he got two, so I want to get two. And he got, so it literally, we had no place to make them. That's it incredible. literally took us over a year to fill those orders. Wow. We stopped taking any orders. We filled those orders. And then we started, you know, that's when we moved to the bigger facility and, decided, hey, maybe we could be a, a, a drum company. Yeah, that's amazing. That's a good problem to have, right, Don? It was a good problem to have, yeah. We started out using Keller shells, uh, which was a shell by an outside shell manufacturer. Then we wanted to make our own so we could uh, kind of the jelly donut. You know, you want to be sure what's on the inside. So right, right. we wanted to make our shells each ply so we knew what each ply was going to be. And just thinking that was a good idea. Mm-hmm. And then the light went on. Uh, hey, we can put anything we want on the outside. Right. Why don't we, you know, go to the hardware store and get an exotic wood? And that's what got John's juices going like, hey, wait a minute. I can, I'm in Germany and they have a, a wood broker there. I didn't know there was such a thing as a wood broker, a guy right. that does nothing but find exotic wood and sell it to people. I mean, yeah. for cabinets, for, you know, billionaires, houses and things like that. But so... Yeah. So John has now become best friends with these wood brokers from around the world. And he's going to Tasmania. He's going to uh, the Stradivari forest uh, and we're buying trees. The first time I saw an invoice for a tree, I walked into John and said, am I out of my tree? What is this? He said, well, I had, it's going to be, it's really good. The wood's going to be great. So we ship it to Escanaba, Michigan. They flitch it, which is like peeling it for us. So, okay. so, and it's, it's interesting because people, I've heard comments like, and even in classifications now, they have the custom drum manufacturers and then they have the production of the bigger drum. It's like, because we make a certain volume of drums, we're out of the custom area. I just, I, I can't buy that because I don't, if you're buying a tree, you can't get much more custom. You're starting out, we plant right. more than we take, by the way. We have a whole. Great. <laughs> so that, you know, that, that goes full circle to your next question, kind of, which is, Always loved teaching. Passion was my teaching. Kind of the family joke is, Dad, company's going great. Things are going good. My son, Chris, has taken over the business side of of running it, uh, which is a total blessing because I hated that and I was never really good at it. Uh, It allows me to keep tinkering and, uh, you know, and and that's that's a huge issue for entrepreneurs because as you start doing what you do in order to become popular and become successful, as the company grows, you have less time to do that. Right. So then there's a big problem with where the future of the company is because what got you there isn't what's motivating you in order to stay in business because there's a whole business side of running the business. Yeah. So great that he took that over. So, you know, I stay 100%, you know, in, on the R&D side. Uh, then as, as, as time went by, it's like uh, I'd like to get more into education, I'd like to get more into education. Well, we have a lot of, clinics and we have an educational you know program here within the manufacturing too but 
really it's a it's a if you're going to be you know in education it's it's a separate mindset it's really a, a it's something that should stand on its own have nothing to do with the manufacturing sure. so the subject came up amongst the family do I want to wait until I'm 160 and do this or you know, what at what point do you just say you know go ahead and do it so I just said you know let's I had uh, great ideas uh, very long story short in terms of the history of the website, but started building it in 2006, 2007, 2008. Um, and in those days, you built websites in an entirely different way. You built them from the ground up. You hired coders, you, right. you, had, to do, you had to do everything. Yeah. So um, stupidly, I should have waited another 10 years and I could have saved a whole lot of money. But, uh, but the, the long story is we built it and we gave the job to a company, fairly good sized company to develop it, um, and they couldn't deliver it in two years. Mm. Uh, two years came by and they delivered something that didn't work. So we then backtracked and put it up in a much simpler format. I was never able to get it up with the original business model. And so we kept it going like that and then the company got very busy again. So I found myself getting pulled back into working full time to we, we had the acquisition of LP, which is a huge, uh, very exciting for me and a big asset for the company. So we're, we're DW has rounded out, you know, all genres of playing, uh, which is great because from an educational standpoint, I definitely saw the hybrid drum set being, you know, the future. So uh, best thing is to have one company that makes every product you would need to produce Latin percussion music, drum set, and, and any combination thereof. So, so I, I, as years go by, right, uh, the, uh, the, you know, that one, yeah. um, uh, I kind of got back to again, well, I better get back to this, you know, the educational side again after, uh, you know, pretty much, you know, leaving it alone for a couple of years. So we then started doing what I wanted to do in 2006, 2007, build it from scratch, but from scratch today is a whole different thing because there's all kinds of plugins you can use and. Uh, yeah. We have one full-time coder here. We have a couple of people who administer the site. So it's it it's it's we debuted it in January of this year. Um, behind the scenes for us, it's phase one of the site. We have several other iterations. We're going to be doing a lot of things coming up even by the end of this year that we'll be announcing that are going to be really really cool for the drum community. Can you um, give us a sneak peek of what that might be, Don? Uh, yes, <laughs> or <can>. not? <laughs> no, I can't. Yeah, uh, I'm just thinking. What? How much can I say? Um, yeah, I mean, it's not. It's it's uh, obviously, you know, we're we're taking a real uh, hard look at how we can overcome the barrier of not being in the same room with you when we're giving you a lesson. So, because especially being such a physical instrument, walking over and grabbing the guy's arm and saying, "Well, it's not like this. It's like this." You know, yeah. Relax a little bit more. Things that. Freddie and Nick used to do all the time, you know, uh, you're not relaxed and you think you're relaxed, but you're not relaxed, you know. So uh, look at um, ways we could, you know, integrate some features into the website. So there's uh, an area where you can uh, record a video. We have our own uploader. You can send it up to a variety of teachers who you would want to look at it. Uh, you can pick your favorite teacher you want to study with. Any one of the, any one of the, it's, it's basically a, a drummer's website. So it's a drum channel, but it's not a place where drummers come to do things. It's a vehicle for them to give the drumming community their information. So they come on and they do really short lessons and they do uh, our lessons that we do you know, live. So you can ask questions every week. Uh, and on those, you know, you get the opportunity to see what the drummer is doing. Then we have a series back to the how, what, and why again. Yeah, you see yeah. what they're doing. Um, how they do what they're doing are a series of courses that we have up showing how the luminary teachers throughout history uh, have taught their students, Murray Spivak's method. Uh, we're going to be putting up Freddie Gruber's method soon, um, which is there's a lot of students who obviously teach that because they study with Freddie, but kind of consolidate all that into, you know, a series of, 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 of lessons. Um, and, I mean, the courses that we have, uh, a complete course on how to get into Berkeley College of Music. So they're kind of like, university level courses um, mm. where today an artist needs to be able, any any artist needs to be able to want to pass on their information mm. when we grew up it was vhs's i don't want to date us but you were there probably right sure of course right <laughs> and cds after that 
uh, uh, and DVDs rather after that. Um, so where does it, you know, those don't exist anymore. So if a drummer wants to do a course, think of it like of the old day DVD. He comes out, we record it for him, we put it up in the store, we sell it for him. So it's a place where drummers can memorialize and pass on their content. Probably the, to answer your question on, you know, what's going to be happening a little bit more new on the site, it's going to have to do with the entertainment side of, of mm -hmm. Drum Channel. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're going to so, be doing some things that are really fun. Um, and the clue is in the name of Drum Channel. Drum Channel is a drum channel. Hey! <laughs> so, That's fantastic. Well, it's already incredible. It's amazing. I'm sorry, go ahead, please. So we're going to have tons of content available for drummers. Yeah. Maybe some uh, bands playing? Is that uh, what you might mean as well? Not only some, I'm having to put, we're booked up through <laughs> July already. Oh, wow. so, so there'll be a whole entertainment side of the site. And it's neat because the player has the slow motion feature. So while you're seeing guys play, that answers the why do you play it. So we'll show you how to play. You know, now you have showing you how to play isn't going to do you any good. By the way, I'm going to speak right into the camera. It's okay. not going to do you any good. You have to practice. So if somebody says, you know, I can show you how to play like Tony Royster in 10 minutes, uh, it ain't going to happen. So the the lesson I recently got an email. Um, actually, it was a little over a year ago um, from a drummer at info at drumchannel.com. He said the lessons on Drum Channel got me a full ride scholarship to Berkeley College of Music. That's and fantastic. He told me what lessons he had taken, and if you're going to get Marco Minimum Six Way Independence, or you're going to take Chad Wackerman's, you know, lessons on how Murray Spivak taught him, it's going to take you a year to go through those, and you're going to have to practice, you know, every day. Now, you don't have to be that type of a drummer. I mean, amateur drummers, weekend drummers, you know, uh, guys that are playing, you know, for fun. The funnest thing is to help them improve, you know, with the least amount of practice possible, and that's that's always good to do too. Sure. Well, and it's already incredible. It's amazing to hear this is just phase one that you're doing because these are some of the best drummers in the world that you have on there. I mean, Greg Bissonette is teaching stuff. You got, uh, you know, when he was, uh, wasn't before he retired, Neil Peart, Thomas Lang on there, all of these incredible, Terry Bozio, all of these incredible folks on the drum channel. Yeah, they're, they're I mean, the list goes, we've, we've had, uh, I just happened to add it up for another reason. We have uh, had 36 new people on in the last three months, so or since January of this year, I guess it would be so over a four-month period. So, and a long list of drummers who are, are looking to come out also. And, and a lot of it is that's why the entertainment I think is is so important. It's not necessarily uh, just seeing how they play, but hearing their life stories. You know, it's it's uh, I have three. We, we're by the time you air this, it'll be up on Drum Channel. But um, there's a great roundtable that we have that we, we just put up uh, um, with four decades of drummers wow. uh, showing their different, the different time periods and what they, what they studied. Terry Bozio, Brandon Buckley, Alex Acuna, um, and uh, Thomas Lang. Uh, so that's and, – and that conversation is not about their life. It's about drummers' lives. What are, what are they saying is important, you know, for you to do if you're going to, one, just improve your, uh, your technique and or how you play, or if you want to really make a living at it. Sure. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And that's the, of course, I'm biased because I do this show and I love hearing drummer stories and folks in the business. That's the other part, in addition to the music, the, the lessons that you teach, all of the interviews that you guys are doing and recently caught, you know, we haven't mentioned him, but you got the Chad Smith show with Chad Smith. That's pretty awesome. And he's on there interviewing Charlie, Charlie Watts from the Stones. Yeah. That's awesome. How is that? Uh, Here's, a, here's something that nobody else knows. Pretty soon we're going to be showing uh, Hal Blaine and Jim Keltner and Charlie Watts. Wow. So when, Charlie, when we did the interview with Chad, I said, uh, somebody came up, I said, yeah, I want to have Hal Blaine out. And Charlie says, oh, I'd love to be part of that. Wow. So uh, I said, that would be great because yeah. so it's, it's really fun to see Charlie Watts excited to be asking questions of another drummer. <laughs> That's incredible. And then get Jim Keltner in and, and when's yeah. Ringo coming in then, Don? Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you all of our secrets. Okay. 
<laughs> okay, that's fantastic. So I'm curious, I, I know we're nearing our time, but I'm curious about what's coming up next for DW. You know, you've, you've done an incredible job as not only a musician, but a businessman in the music community of identifying needs and creating this amazing niche. What, what is another need that the drumming community needs right now that you guys are looking at, if you can say? Uh, well, I mean, anybody that had the crystal ball there would be in pretty good, pretty good shape. Uh, yeah, I, I think there's, I think there's, you know, for us is much of a, of a great reputation DW has, which I'm certainly grateful for. Um, we still, by volume, make you know very few drums compared to uh, the larger production manufacturers. Um, in that, the smallest piece of the pie are drum sets that are over two thousand dollars or twenty five hundred dollars. That's maybe thirty percent or less of all drum sets sold. So, fortunately, you know we do real well there. People appreciate the quality of what we're doing. And if you're spending that amount of money, you're gonna you're going to possibly know a little bit more about sound, about, you know, what you're looking for. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the big part of the market that comes under that, you know, is what we came up with PDP for to give somebody the best value they could have out of a drum set, um, which is another part of our drumming life and world. Um, and then, you know, the Latin percussion, you know, side of it. And I think, you know, probably if we're looking at, you know, the, the, the future, uh, it's, it's, the high the idea of hybrid kits where i think more drummers are going to have to have as part of their drum set other ethnic instruments around it certainly electronics is becoming down more and more in price so that'll become more part of of a drummer's arsenal i believe um and that's another way you would you know make a hybrid drum set with some percussion items with some electronic items so that uh, as you opened up the show, you know, and, you know, and the old joke would be, yeah, there's four musicians and a drummer in the band. Uh, well, it, the, the drummer, you know, is going to be, you know, not only a musician, but a flagship musician in a band, adding rhythmically and musically and tonally to what's, what's going on. You'll never replace the main function of the job of the drummer, you know. That's where electronic drums back in the 80s just became just crazy because it was uh, somebody came out uh, – Somebody did an audition once, I forget the player, but uh, and it was a true story. And he went there with his, uh, I think it was a Simmons kit back in the day and a million different sounds. And he went to the rehearsal and used it and everything. And this major star, you know, turned around after doing her big dance act and something and said to one of the managers, somebody, that's great. All we need now is a drummer. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, thankfully they've come a long ways, but because the the 80s were not great with the electronic drums. So no, no. So I think so. It's hard to see. You know, I think the musicality has level has gone up so much, and YouTube is a big part of that. And this whole idea of the high bid drum sets is all a function of the internet too, because you've got players around the world getting exposed to jazz at an early age. Um, you know, it used to be you'd have to leave Cuba and come to New York to hear jazz and then take it back and then figure it out. So now the you know, young teenagers coming out of those cultures that have that steeped background are understanding what other cultures are doing. And they're coming up here and just blowing our mind. Right. Yeah, it's incredible. Any plans for DW to get into the electronic drum business as part of that hybrid kit? There's always plans. Okay. Uh, <laughs> everybody's always planning a lot of things. Got it. Uh, got it. Yep. Uh, yeah. And actually, you know, um, putting our little foot into that water is something that's going to be, you know, interesting for us. But as, yeah. as we always do it, if, if, and when we do that, it's going to be in quite a completely different way. Okay. So I'll, I'll just leave you uh, wondering what the heck that could possibly be. <laughs> okay. <laughs> more, more to unfold in the future, it sounds like. Exactly. Well, As always in the, in the drumming world. That's right. That's right. So then let me ask you lastly then, for someone who would like to, you know, be a musician or, and or get to where you are. I mean, you're, you've created this amazing, you know, you're doing good work in the world, Don, is what you're doing with this all these drums how does somebody get there uh i think you just have to obviously as a player you have to have it as your your passion you know i don't think anybody does that for the money 
Um, I mean, I've had, heard a few drummers, great drummers, say at an early age they realized that the drummer got the girl in high school, so we thought that would be cool right. if I was. And then, but they loved playing anyway. Uh, so I, I think you have to have, you know, obviously a passion for what you're doing. Um, you have to, you know, really make a commitment that, you know, whatever happens, you know, it's realistic that you could make a business out of what your passion is because it could easily be a hobby and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you can do it, but you know, it's, it's a difficult, different time today than it was, you know, when I started for sure. Um, so I, I, I think anybody, you know, I'm, I'm certainly the one to encourage anyone that wants to get into either drum manufacturing. Obviously I think everybody in the world should be a drummer. Uh, what are you doing out there? Right. And if you don't think you should, by the way, uh, I have a lesson on drum channel where I guarantee you in 10 minutes, I can teach you how to play it. Fantastic. My grandmother learned my, it's, it's just like, you don't even need a drum set. I can, the whole idea of I can't walk and chew gum, I'll never be a drummer. Forget it. It's, 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 it's inherently in everybody. So uh, that's my big pitch of this whole conversation. I, I love guess. it. That's if fantastic. You play drums, believe me, you, you can, right. And that's no matter how good you get, every drummer we have that comes out here is a student. Right. I mean, yes. They're all, it's, it's, it's endless. So you're, you're on a, on a quest that's going to go, you know, forever and forever and forever. So right. I, mean, um, I would right. just, I would encourage anybody to follow whatever they would like to do. That's great. Yeah. Buddy Rich was still learning and Jim Chapin was still learning until he, you know, died. So it was really great. Don Lombardi, thank you so much for being on Musicians on the Record today. Thank you, uh, David, for having me and, and congratulations on your success. Keep doing it. <laughs>